Good morning and welcome to this service of Holy Communion. This morning, according to the Book of Common Prayer, we begin uh, this service, first of all, by the lighting of the Advent wreath. The service has begun. The service has begun. The service has begun. I would ask that uh, our Director of Christian Education come forward for the lighting of the wreath. Today we light the second Advent candle. It is the candle of peace. So I'm going to ask everyone to repeat after me. We pray, O oh God, for hope and peace in our world. We pray, O oh God, for hope and peace. to participate in the singing of the litany as indicated on your list. Spare us, good Lord, 
pardon, to raise up those who fall, and finally to beat Satan down under our feet. We beseech thee, good Lord, to succor, help, and comfort all that are in danger and necessity and tribulation. We beseech thee, good Lord, to have mercy upon all men. We beseech thee, good Lord, to give and preserve to our youth the kindly fruits of the earth, so that in due time we may enjoy them. We beseech thee, good Lord, to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. We beseech thee, good Lord, to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances, and to endure us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, to attend our lives according to thy holy word. We beseech thee, good Lord. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world, Chapter 3, beginning from verse 1. 
See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi, and refine them like gold and silver, until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Common Prayer, starting on page 9. We will read the following. Blessed be the Lord, God of Israel, for he hath visited us in his and hath raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of the holy prophets, which have been since that we should be saved from our enemies. To perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy life. To perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham, that he would grant us. That we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him in, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people, for the of their sins. through the tender mercy of our God, we are the day on high us. To give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and ever shall be. The epistle is written in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, beginning at the third verse. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to learn what is best, so that on the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. Would you please rise and join in the singing of the breath?
with you. The Holy Gospel is in the Gospel according to Luke, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. In the 50th, 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, the ruler of the region of Itria and Trapionis, and Licinius, ruler of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Could you, with us, proclaim the creed as found in page 71 of your Book of Common Prayer? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all that is visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost as the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified as a servant and conscious of he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again in the glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. Who say by the prophets, and I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I hope for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. I may, by way of prayer, reread the collect. Blessed Lord, who has caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of that holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm very grateful to the rector and to you all for welcoming me to, to worship in this very, very, very special place. I'm also very grateful to you for giving me the opportunity of spending some time with the three readings we've just heard this morning. At first glance, the three readings are, they share a common theme, and that theme is prepare the way of the Lord. They're good Advent readings as we wait and abide in hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. But the reading from Philippians isn't about that. 
reading from Philippians isn't about the coming of the Messiah. So what then is it that binds these three readings? In the King James translation of Philippians, Paul says that he, he longs for the Philippians, he desires for their good from the very bowels of Christ. Amazing, amazing phrase. It's that visceral desire for salvation that binds the three readings. Malachi tells us about the coming of the Messiah, but does so in a way that confuses and disorients us. Because he says, you're waiting, you're desiring, you're longing, but watch out. The Messiah will be a, a winnowing fork. The Messiah will bring turmoil and tumult. John the Baptist the voice of one crying in the wilderness is calling for repentance. And he's telling us that we can only see the Messiah with this repentance, which is this massive change of heart. It is seeing the world completely differently. And that's the challenge that we have during Advent. How do we long with a visceral desire for salvation? Because make no mistake, if we don't, we don't get to see Christ. All through the New Testament, those who are in need, those who are on the margins, those who are screaming out, save me, O Lord, those who are saying, my daughter is dying, those who are saying, I'm dying, I'm, I'm afflicted by this disease, they're the ones who long to touch his hem, and they're the ones who meet Christ and are saved by Christ. But the smug, and the self-righteous, those who think they don't need Christ, like the rich young ruler, like the Pharisees, they never see who Christ is. He's just a dude walking around causing trouble. So there's two kinds of people. Those who have this visceral longing for salvation, those who know that they are broken and know this world needs healing, for those who didn't know, we thought. And so we go through this Advent series, season waiting and longing. I think the task of any preacher in the second Sunday of Advent is to try and help us as a community to get into this space. And that's where you're unlucky. <laughs> because your preacher has no training in preaching. Your preacher never went to the seminary. I don't know how to come out here like John the Baptist in Lion Claw. There's not a single person here whose life would be enhanced by seeing me in Lion Claw. <laughs> and whipping up a, an awareness of our need. Preaching terrifies me. When I first came to AST, I realized after my first semester that in the second semester I was going to have to preach. And at this stage, I'd given talks and lectures before audiences of 3,000 or more. And I was terrified of preaching before 15 people at AST Chapel. I remember asking our professor of preaching at the time, <laughs> What do I do? I have no clue here. And he said, you know all that arcane, highfalutin theology that you're into, all that Thomas Aquinas stuff, will never mention any of that. <laughs> Sorry about this, we said here. He said that the congregation need practical pastoral help. That was about 13 years ago. And today, is the first time ever in my experience where the highfalutin theology might actually be of some practical help. Because we've got a problem. The problem is that we've got to wait with a visceral longing, we've got to yearn for the coming of Jesus Christ, but in one sense we know 
He's already come. It's a strange weirdness that we deal with in Advent. It was brought home to me during the week. My next door neighbor is, I don't know, is the more secular person in the world to my, to my next door neighbor. And he said to me, what's that, what's that kind of flower thing on your front door? We've got an advent wreath on our door. And I said, it's an advent wreath. And he looked at me with that expression, and I knew that he'd never heard that word advent before in his life. And, I said, and, and, and he said, what is this advent I said, well, it's a, it's a time where Christians are waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. And he looked at me again with confusion and sympathy. He said, you mean Jesus Christ? But I think, I think he may have already come. I think about 2,000 years ago. And he was right. Like, we know, we, we, we read that book. We know how the story ends. So our challenge is, how do we long, like Malachi called, called us to long, like the people who John the Baptist called us to long, this visceral desire, but we already know that we're talking about a past event. And we say we're waiting, we're waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ, but what, what are we doing? I want to conclude with two theological bits of weirdness that might help us with this. The first one is the weirdest. And it's a theological principle that the church fathers play around with, and Thomas Aquinas plays around with. And it's weird, and it's unsettling, and we can't think of it, we can't wrap our heads around it, and it doesn't make any sense at all, and it might help us as we make our way to Advent. What's this theological idea? The theological idea is the truth that God is eternal, and therefore every point in time is co-present to God. There is no past, present and future. This linear timeline that we're living on, in which Jesus was born, as my next door neighbor knows well, a couple of, a couple of centuries ago. As we said, Jesus was born a couple of hundred years ago. We, Jesus was born back there, and we're here, and there'll be a future. That linear timeline is how we experience it. But God is outside of time, and therefore all the moments on this timeline are equally immediate to God. That's one of the really strange things that happens at the Eucharist. Because God is present, your great 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 grandparents are present. And your great 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 grandchildren are present. Because time is not this linear thing from God's perspective. It's a continuous space where God relates to us. And we have the opportunity to accept this union with God and know God. When we think about this, we can begin to shake off the heresy that says time is banal. Within this time, what matters most is that God is seeking to give himself to you through the Holy Spirit, and you are here at this time. Everything else is fluff. The second theological point, again, another weird point that's raised by church fathers like John Chrysostom. We see it again in all of Berlin. It's a strange theological question they ask. It's a hypothetical. If the only person on the planet was you, or you, or you, would Jesus Christ have given himself totally to the point of torture, annihilation, and death in love of you? And their answer is, yes. Now that changes things a little bit. It's not that Jesus is going, okay, 
you know, I've got to come and I've got to give myself totally without remainders of God the Father. And it's going to be brutal, it's going to be horrible. But I'm going to do it in absolute love of these people. How many are there? And then he'd say, okay, if it's going to be seven billion, I'll do it. If it's six billion, I won't. Now, if it's just you, that's sufficient for Christ to give himself totally. So Christ goes through the crucifixion for you. Think, think in your head right now. Think of your name. Say it to yourself. That's the reason for the incarnation. That's sufficient reason for the crucifixion. That's sufficient reason for everything that Christ did. Your name. That's sufficient. Because we're wrong. We don't know how the story ends. We think we've read it all. We think we've seen it all. But we haven't because it's not about Jesus being born in the stable. It's not even about Golgotha and the empty tomb. Because these things are simply in the service of God being one with you. That's what it's about. That's the goal. These things, these events, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, are simply moments in the story of God's union with you. Your name. That name you said to yourself earlier on. And so we don't know how it ends. We don't know if Jesus wins or not. Because the winning is you. The winning is that you would go through this advent in a way as to accept this union with Jesus Christ such that every moment in this is seen as a moment for saying yes to Jesus Christ. Yes to Jesus Christ in the form of your loved ones. Yes to Jesus Christ in the form of the poor. Yes to Jesus Christ in the form of outcast. Yes to Jesus Christ in the form of creation itself. That's how this is meant to end. And it has to end. And you and your actions this advent will decide it. So to conclude, this isn't, like my neighbor says, God bless him, a past story that we know how it ends. We're not playing some some strange memorial game where we're going to pretend that we're waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ when we know that he's already came in a stable in Bethlehem and fight to Egypt and we know all the stuff that happened. We're waiting for this union with God. And we need to long for this union and realize that this is the time and our actions and our yes to God will tell us how the story is. Would you please rise for the offertory? Yeah.
Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, forever and ever. All is in heaven and the earth is thine. All things come to thee. 